Hello, welcome everybody for the fourth plenary lecture of the AILA World Congress. Uh, we will have a, a, a talk of about 50 minutes provided by Angela Kreis. She's here in person with us. Then we have a question answer session, and after the question answer session, uh, there will be a short speech of the president of the Malaysian Association of Applied Linguistics. And then don't forget to stay here, to stay here um, for the Malaysian night uh, to have Malaysian food and beverages. So, uh, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Angela Kreese. She's Professor of Linguistic Ethnography at the U Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Stirling. And her work is situated between social linguistics, linguistic anthropology, classroom discourse, second language acquisition and language policy. She has currently led two research projects on translation and translanguaging, and today in her talk, she will invite us to think about our posture as researcher and show how ethnographic drama or the other types of artistic work can help us to better understand the sensory and effective, effective dimensions of social life. And if you are online, uh, please think to click twice on the red transmission button to have the video on the full stream. And I give the floor to Angela. Well, thank you very much, Isla, um, for the privilege of um, being invited to give this uh, talk uh, this afternoon and for all the work you have done on our behalf uh, for delivering a fabulous um, conference um, to date. So, um, this talk considers the researcher as a listening subject and the responsibility this entails in the representation of difference. I start with a reading from Voices of a City Market, which draws on arts-based research to raise questions of representation, precarity of employment in higher education, and hierarchy in research teams. The bulk of voices is made up of ethnographic poems, curation of field notes, audios, and photographs of a city fish and meat market. But the foreword and the afterword are written in the form of a play script. This is an imaginary research team representing nine voices beyond those typically present in a research team and listed here and staged with the characters speaking to one another in the round. You will hear a conversation between four of the characters from this foreword. And um, these are the professor, the entrepreneur, the researcher, and the documentary novelist. In the project, I'm the Chinese researcher. Sometimes I feel that I'm treated as if all I bring to the project is speaking Chinese. But a Chinese speaker is not all I am. I'm not sure it's fair to say that you are treated as if all you bring to the project is speaking Chinese. We needed to recruit someone who could speak and understand Chinese languages, of course. But more than that, we wanted to work with someone who was able to establish good relationships with participants and work easily in a range of contexts. Be independent, contribute to analysis from an insider's point of view. Actually, our intention was to recruit a researcher of Chinese heritage who'd lived in this country all their lives. But as it turned out, your background was ideal because you shared much of the migration history of the research participants. It meant you could offer the perspective of an insider. That's just it. I don't have an insider's point of view. <laughs> just the fact that I'm from China doesn't make me an insider. In fact, in some ways, it's irrelevant. 
actually but you have been, been in this country for about the same number of years as the two butchers. You must surely feel that you share that experience with them. The migrant journey, the becoming, belonging and being, the integration into society. You have that same hinterland to draw on, don't you? It's only part of it. How much do you share with everyone else who's lived in this country for the last 50 years? Are you all the same? Do you have everything in common? <laughs> do you choose to be characterised as a white male middle class 50 something has been, as a, a more or less liberal but too pompous to listen to intellectual who would have produced the perfect piece of theatre if only circumstances had not been against him? Do you share this experience with all other white male middle class 50 something has beens? Or are you able to position yourself in other ways because you have the power to do so? I mean, who gets to choose? The entrepreneur takes his coffee outside the circle and stands with his back to the others. We should be civil to each other, even if we don't agree. Mud slinging isn't going to help. I mean, I see your point. No one wants to be just a stereotype. It irritates me the way researchers are treated by universities. Can I get a permanent contract? No. Can I get a mortgage? No. I go beyond what I'm supposed to do, transcribing hundreds of hours of recordings, working on my own. Most of it never used for anything. I mean, do you know how long it takes? Thousands of hours of listening to people buy meat. It was a great project. I enjoyed it. Don't get me wrong. It was interesting from start to finish. But I work harder than anyone. I do everything I'm asked to. And so what? Will it get me another job when this is over? No way. I am completely sympathetic to that. But that's the system. It's what you bought into when you took the job. Researchers are very rarely able to find permanent or extended contracts. It's just the way it is, and I'm sure you knew that. But that doesn't make it all right. You can't just accept things the way they are because they are the way they are. It isn't right. The script highlights the unfinishedness of debate in research teams. The scene is a construction, an imagination, which serves to represent an experience of undertaking research. We were concerned that the play script should represent multiple voices to articulate the truth of what we experienced in doing the research. Throughout this talk, my focus is the researcher. The researcher as self, the researcher as other, the researcher as author, the researcher as character, the researcher as witness, and the researcher as vulnerable. The talk is in three parts. Part one introduces the context, the research project, and the research team. It focuses on seven individual research vignettes which are played throughout the talk without commentary. You are invited to listen to these vignettes, experiencing how the researcher represents difference. Part two describes the philosophy of relational ethics to which I turn for a better understanding of the researcher as the listening subject. In the humanism of the other, I find an ethical balance to the researcher's unknowingness and an approach um, to the individual as unique, but not autonomous or sovereign. Part three continues the theme of the researcher, and I return again to ethnographic drama, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the form of ethnographic drama, in which I argue this is a way to keep the research report open and retain the unfinishedness, polyphony, and mutuality of undertaking research. That's not my phone, is it? I hope not. <laughs> um, a... A recent um, team ethnography I took part in asked how do people communicate in contexts of social and linguistic diversity. And throughout this talk, I will be referring to this project as TLANG. Like other sociolinguists, we use the encounter 
as our starting point in order to document the extraordinary complexity of contemporary social configurations and challenge the idea that durable and well-defined social groups are at the core of social action. In Tilang, we located public places where communicative action practices were observable and where strangers came into contact with each other. And to give you a sense of the project, I'm going to play some short extracts from field notes from the Birmingham case study um, to the left there across the four phases of the research, business, heritage, sport and law. Chinese woman in her 60s walks up to the butcher, asking him where she can buy mutton. The butcher stretches out his body above the counter, trying to direct the woman to the mutton stall. The butcher's Mandarin isn't very easy to understand with his strong Fijian accent, and the Chinese woman is still confused about where to find the stall. Victor, an asylum seeker in his mid-thirties, suffering from severe depression, walks in. He greets me and Joanne, the key participant. Did you go to the job centre? asked Joanne before he can say anything. He was here to see Joanne last week and we both remember him very well. He seemed to be at a low point in his life with his wife and children having left him and his shop having been set on fire about six months ago. He sits and speaks in a low, emotionless voice, as if telling the story of a stranger. The coach, Joe, sits on the floor, changing his shoes. He greets some of the players he doesn't know, asking them their names and introducing them himself. Hi, my name is Joe. I'm coaching tonight. Your name is? Joe's key concern at this stage is not so much to know where the players are from as to know that they are volleyball players. His focus is on what unites the group. An older man comes to the desk and says enthusiastically to Millie, Hello, I haven't seen you for ages. Millie responds in kind, and the man asks for a certain publication as he takes his leave and says, Nice to see you. I'm not sure what you see and hear in these short extracts, but what I came to see in these rather mundane accounts of fleeting interactions in Birmingham is what Appiah calls the inherent quality of personhood and human dignity. Well, you might be thinking, that's a rather grand claim for what on the fa face of it are some field notes about some pretty routine interactions. Aren't these just convivial moments in prosaic lives? And anyway, Hasn't conviviality already been roundly critiqued for its unrealistic optimism against the odds and its smiley multiculturalist hands across the divide explanation of diversity? In other words, a wholly positive view of conviviality is untenable. As Rampton puts it neatly, what is characterised as convivial will very much depend on the contingencies of where, when, how, by and to whom it is produced. Like Rampton and others, we saw that diversity itself does not prompt people to interact convivially. But when I listen to these representations, I find myself asking why researchers portray these relationships in this way as attentive, generous, convivial. And I find my answer not in discourse and its analysis, but in ethics. And this means turning to a strand of philosophy which conceives of subjectivity not as formed in language with its unavoidable functionality of naming, knowing, and essentializing, but in alterity, and the incomprehensible, irreducible singularity of the other. Here, in the ethics of alterity, meaning is not found in words, but in the face of the human other. The face addresses me and holds me responsible. 
In this relationship, there is an unknowingness forever open to impression in the way the researcher can never fully predict, control, or describe. Sociolinguistics makes an important contribution to understanding how language discriminates, shames, and distorts the human subject. Perhaps it does less to know how language humanizes and dignifies. And I find myself wondering, as a critical sociolinguist, how I might avoid falling prey to easy romanticizing and celebration, but also how to retain the representation of dignity that people bring to their relations with different others. Over the last 20 years, I have worked mostly in large research teams, multi-sighted, multilingual, and multidisciplinary. Such research teams are fluid spaces of contestation and alterity. I have long believed that the research team in any project requires a bespoke research question of its own, which investigates how a team works towards encountering and representing difference. Through experience, I have become aware of the dangers of power dynamics in teams, a risk Baha noted back in 1996 when she observed, a recent trend among some anthropologists is to work as overseers of large teams of assistants on big research projects. The tendency is to depersonalize one's connection to the field, to treat ethnographic work, only a small part of which is done personally by the principal investigator, as that which is other to the self. And it is with foresight that Bihar describes the future funding regimes of the neoliberal university. And in many ways, this describes me on the Tlang project in the sense that although I visited all 16 research sites, I was not, for the most part, a field researcher. Gershin has coined the concept of neoliberal agency to describe the way individuals are asked to manage their own careers and livelihoods within neoliberal environments. The kind of personhood forces people to become subjects for themselves. Gershon argues that neoliberal perspectives restructure what it means to be an individual. She asks, what ethical, analytical labor should anthropologists perform when confronted with neoliberal perspectives? And this question is relevant to me when I consider my own responsibility to the research teams I have participated in and now lead. As someone who started their career as a contract researcher working on short-term fixed contracts, I know firsthand what it is to negotiate a profession under such precarious working conditions. Like many others starting work in the academy in the 1990s, I worked on a number of research and teaching contracts, at one point holding down seven different contracts for nearly but not quite a full-time job. And into such hostile environments, the researcher is placed. An environment which endorses individual autonomy, competition, and standalone resilience. And from this place, the researcher not only forms relationships with the other, but goes on to represent them. Because after all, research in its simplest terms is one person's representation of another. And the key question for qualitative research is, what can one person say about another? And here I pause to remind you that throughout this talk, there will be intervals where we listen to the voices of researchers from the Tlang project. Each reading comes from one of the sites of the overall project, so across the four city uh, case studies and across the four themes of business heritage, uh, sport, and law. In the Tlang project, I, I asked the researchers to write a vignette at the end of each of the field 
um, site visit phase, so at the end of business, heritage, sport and law. So typically after four months. So as they were exiting the field, they were asked to write a vignette of around a 1,000 words, and you're going to hear short snippets of those longer documents. A vignette is an example of a biographical and speaker-centred approach um, to recording and producing and writing up research. They incorporate short stories, poetry, photographs, journals. They're examples of fragmented and layered writing. A vignette produces accounts of feelings, desires, needs, aesthetic reactions, and moral dispositions. And uh, you're going to hear from seven um, of the Tlang researchers. I will return to their names um, at different points, but there are seven um, Tlang researchers. And we're going to hear first from Agnieszka Lyons, uh, who is from the um, London um, case uh, study. And uh, she is describing her work in a Polish uh, grocery store. Conducting research with a couple who were shop owners was very interesting. At the beginning, it was Tadeusz that I interacted with more. But as the weeks went by, my relationship with Editha strengthened and developed into a sort of friendship. Editha wanted me to visit when she, rather than her husband, was around and was really pleased to have someone to talk to when there were no customers in the shop. It's such a small shop that you can't really avoid interacting with each other. It's also not very busy in general, so Editha and I spend a lot of time talking about pretty much everything, well, apart from academic stuff. I knew she thought there was a big divide between me being quite academic and her being not academic at all. She often brought it up, saying she wasn't intelligent or studious. I found myself covering up behind a jokey, down-to-earth persona and did my best to shed this academic self of mine. I felt very protective of Editha at the same time, playing down the scariness of the forthcoming visit from the big professor, that would be Angela, by the way, and trying to cushion Editha's interactions in the academic context. In conversations with the key participants, I often asked myself how much I should say or ask to maintain good relationships with them, but not cross the line. And I also wondered what the line was anyway. In the end, in the emptiness of the shop, I tried to be myself rather than some researcher with a magnifying glass through which I would inspect participants' lives. After all, I was asking them for quite a lot. I was asking them to record and video record and give me insights into their private lives. I approach difference through the philosophy of Emmanuel Levinas, who argues that Liberalism fails to account for generosity, trust, love, and being for the others. He saw that an unhindered movement of sovereign ego in its autonomy and its absolute freedom leads to indifference and ultimately tyranny. In an inversion of liberal politics, Levinas resists the self-referential prioritization of ego. His philosophy proposes a radical ethics which counters the liberal tradition of uncaring individualism. And his philosophy has been described as inverted liberalism because it flips a liberal conceptualization of individuality on its head by retaining singularity but losing autonomy. For Levinas, individuals no longer serve themselves but are bound to the other relationally. Levinas is radical because he upends the way we conceive of ethical relations. The awakening is not in the I am I, but, I, but in the I am for. And this means at the most primary level, we are acted upon by others in ways in which we have no say. Sorry, I've gone, let me, I can go back. Um, in which we have no say. It is this passivity and impingement which inaugurates us into who we are, Judith Butler says. This willingness to be commanded, this unfreedom, this trauma is what makes humans ethical. It is to be for the other 
without the assurance they will be for me. We're going to listen now to Juhua, who is at a karate club for the London uh, sports phase of the research. It was difficult to build rapport with a key participant and to have a real sense of getting to know him. Since our interactions were mediated or translated, and liked spontaneity. But despite this, I begin to see his warm heartedness and determination through the way he interacts with his students. He's very observant and notices everything that's going on in the room. The way he cares about his students, he walked over at the end of the session to check the students who didn't feel well during the session. He soothed a child who was crying because he thought he was hurt. And the way he teases his students, he sometimes laughs at his own pretended strictness in class. What Lavinus does is to recast the other as the crucial character in the process through which the moral self comes into its own. Lavinus offers a theoretical direction which presents social action as neither located in indifferent individualism nor in descriptions of totalizing subjectivities. Levinus's philosophy dramatically distinguishes itself from neoliberal accounts of the romantic portrayal of triumphant individuals because subjectivity commences not in sovereignty but through upholding the unassailable other whose difference must be heard. In sociolinguistics, we are confident in our claim that individuals come to occupy the position of subject through discourse. But Levinus explains signification in radically different ways. And before we get to that, we will listen to Yolana Hanasova um, describing uh, taking part in a capoeira class for the lead sports phase of the project. Capoeira was one of the first things that came into our minds when we were gathering ideas for the sports phase of the project, in which we wanted to explore the use of Portuguese language in the context of sports. Already in the second class I was asked by the mestre to join in, and so I became an active participant rather than a researcher or an observer, and became perceived as such by others, despite my occasional note-taking and assisting Tiago with attaching the recorder. And very soon I started feeling very much as a part of the group, as I was getting to know the people through the actual practice of capoeira, as well as from our chats after classes, when we would often head to the Brudenal Social Club for a pint, before heading home for a well-deserved shower. And before the fourth month period of observation was over, I was decided to, official, to officially join the group and carry on with capoeira in the future. According to Levinas, the beginning of language is in the face and in the body, in a certain way in its silence, which nevertheless calls you. Language does not begin with the signs that one gives with words. Language is above all the fact of being addressed. The face is a notion through which man comes to me via a human act different from knowing. The face is generosity and a moment of faith. Levinus pushes back against semiosis as sign in the linguistic sense. His concern is not with what we know through language or other modalities, but rather the signification gained through being in contact with others. The face, therefore, provides the possibility of ethical kinship, but also political action, because observing the face of the other is a call to address injustice. We're now going to listen to Daria jakowitz pital who will uh, be describing her work in the Community Advice Centre for the London Law Phase. I often felt I could identify with the key participant, Mihalina, in some ways. 
there was this sense of shared knowledge about the reality of the old Poland, sort of 1980s, 1990s. For example, the context of sarcastic jokes about pointless cues. Shelves in shops during communism were empty, so a cue meant something was offered for sale. Whatever it was, it was a good idea to cue. For tea, for soap, for washing machines. Grotesque. Tacky glass holders, identical in each and every Polish ha- household, or spitting with tobacco when smoking cigarettes without a filter. Just to explain that no other cigarettes were available, so all smokers were spitting around. Our shared knowledge was also a context for bitter memories, as I could see sad similarities between Mihalina's and my mother's life stories, which were reminders that I am happy to be right here and now. On the other hand, little tangible things like the old-fashioned crystal fruit bowl, exactly like the one my beloved grandma used to have in her kitchen, or the habit of drinking tea the Polish way with sugar and lemon, or the music of Michał Lorenz played next door to Michalina's office. All these brought back the past Poland into present-day London and made me realize I miss people and places which are only memories. It also made me understand I'm part of something that doesn't exist anymore and if it is my Polishness, it exists neither here nor in Poland. Yet I don't feel British either. Polish language seemed to link all these dispersed worlds into one meaningful world to me, the one in which I live. I could tell Mihalina's feelings were similar. Through Levinas, we arrive to the listening subject. In the ethics of alterity, the listening subject does not approach the other as already determined in discourse, but as accessible through perception. What I take from Levinas is a non-essentializing explanation for the care and responsibility researchers show others in field and team relations. The other is said by Levinas to be the beginning of a more responsive self, opening avenues to the other in me. Levinas's ethical stance highlights difference and the unknowability of the other suggesting that categorizing, explaining, or even attempting to understand such uniqueness always reduces the other. To speak of the human subject, therefore, is to speak of the ethical subject, the resonant subject, and the listening subject, attending to meaning as a sense, an echo, an effect, a reverberation. The researcher as the listening subject is an ethical, sensing and relational subject whose agency shapes not only social space but also moral and aesthetic space. We're now going to listen to Adrian Blackledge reading his vignette of the Birmingham Indoor uh, Fish and Meat Market for the Birmingham business phase of the research. 370. 370. 370. Too expensive. Eight pounds a kilo. Eight pounds. 370. The head of a young goat. Crystals of ice defrosting on eyebrows and eyelashes, falling as tears. Ten pig hearts, five pounds. A woman buys a large piece of pork belly. Do you want it cut? She indicates with her hand. Sliced? She nods. Scald, cauterize. Boil for three hours with fistfuls of salt until bleached. Then drench 
still steaming and hot with nothing but sweet malt vinegar. Cows' feet line glass countertops. Each hoof or toe or toenail, or is it fingernail, is painted vibrant pink, not carefully, but roughly, clumsily, as if the very last thing to be done before the sacrifice was the application of a small touch of glamour. I would say that across these vignettes, we see researchers invited into subject positions. The research vignette represents the relational and dialogic encounter with participants who often respond in unexpected ways and in which ethical responses and ways of being require moment by moment, real time decision making. The vignettes capture affect, embodied sensing and intuition, the kind which apparently defies logic, but which nevertheless profoundly influences research practice. And we're going to listen to Francis Rock now describe a community football um, exercise uh, group uh, for children for the Cardiff sports phase. This, the sports site, was a site of discovery and contrasts. This was the site where we finally got to observe the language play of children firsthand. It was a site where we found out that our research was genuinely offensive and unsettling to some people. It was a site where we reappraised our ethical commitments in various ways and weren't afraid to walk away from data collection opportunities when we were unhappy with this side of our research. Search vignettes describe what it feels like to work in a team in which there are pre-existing hierarchies. They document what happens when the researcher walks into the world of complete strangers and is faced with the, subject, with the task of subjecting them to intense scrutiny. They deal with the tensions, anxieties, missteps, recoveries and small victories of the process. Research vignettes are intended as spaces for researchers to address these tensions and for the team to pay attention to them. And I'm persuaded by Bahar's account of the vulnerable observer in which she argues for an anthropology that wears its heart on its sleeve, occupying a borderland between passion and intellect analysis and subjectivity, art and life. And we'll listen to the last vignette now by Rachel Hu, is, who is at the uh, Birmingham Library for the um, heritage phase of the project. Handling the relationships mainly the key participants wasn't as easy as I thought, especially at the very beginning of our fieldwork. The fact that Mini speaks very little Mandarin and I know even less Cantonese left us no option but to speak English to each other. Mili is quite outspoken and straightforward and sometimes she addressed me in front of her colleagues as Yu Menlan Chinese, leaving me a bit uneasy, let alone her often asked quite stereotyped questions about Menlan Chinese darted at me when I least expected. For example, when I was happily chatting with the Library of Birmingham staff at lunch breaks. As time went by, I found that we actually share quite a lot in common, particularly in how to keep our independence in marriage, bring up children, learn new skills, and so on. She is quite jokey and chatty, gentle and polite, which makes her pleasant company, hence she is well liked by her colleagues. She seems to have the power to mellow people around her. I started to see how being non-judgmental and tolerant can work its magic when getting along with a stranger. I could tell Millie gradually opened up to me in the last two months as she was more cooperative than she was at the beginning. Sometimes, when listening to Millie talking, I just couldn't help thinking to myself what I could have missed if I hadn't repositioned myself after our first clash. 
Difference matters deeply to people, of course. As Stuart Hall puts it, I come to the present to who I am by a different route from yours, and therefore our conversation has to recognise that different histories have produced us. Different histories have made this conversation possible. I can't pretend to be you. I don't know your experience. I can't live from inside your head. So our living together must depend on a conversation. To scrutinise my own and others listening, looking and writing within team ethnography, it is useful to work with two theorisations of difference, at least I have found. The first is difference from, which considers the, way, the ways in which a unique subject articulates its difference from the other. Biesta describes difference from as an instrumental difference, which involves the naming of identities to categorize and make distinctions. Here, difference is, in, is an effect of discourse in which people become categorized and knowable to themselves and others. The second theorization refers to indifference, a term which I've taken from Quinton Williams, in which indifference is a feature of being human and demands a response to the other. To be in a state of indifference is to respond to the ethical demand to trust the stranger with all the attendant hopes and disappointments that that brings. And that's from Logstrop. In the research vignettes, we see both approaches to difference taken up. Social categories of difference from are certainly relevant to the researcher as they reflect on languages, identities, nationalities. But we also see researchers dwell in difference as they open to the vulnerability of others as well as to their own. Whenever we write ethnography, there is a risk of exposure and vulnerability. And in the precarious contractual employment arrangements of the neoliberal university, there is a greater risk for some than others. Contract, doctoral, and early career researchers are more likely than tenured staff to feel they are being appraised. Like other forms of ethnographic writing, vignettes run the risk of making the researcher vulnerable. And it is to other forms of ethnographic writing that I now turn. Since the end of the TLANG project uh, four years ago, we have continued writing up our findings and our work, but we have chosen to do it in a very different genre. Well, I shouldn't say we've chosen to do it in a different genre. We've continued writing up in genres such as academic articles, case study reports, academic texts. But we've also, um, with Adrian Blackledge, um, been writing up um, our work uh, in the form of ethnographic poetry and ethnographic drama. And we would characterise this um, broadly as arts-based research. And although terminology varies, arts-based research approaches can be defined as research that uses the arts in the broadest sense to explore, understand, and represent human action and experience. And in particular, we have found inspiration, as I said, in ethnographic poetry, and Adrian Blackwedge will be talking about ethnographic poetry in the symposium tomorrow that Maggie Korbanova is leading on sociolinguistics, ethics, and the art of encountering the other. Um, but um, in addition, uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about in more detail now, is ethnographic drama. So we have been um, writing up our work in the form of uh, play scripts. Ethnographic drama um, dramatizes the stuff that we typically call data. It dramatizes interview transcripts, field notes, journals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, all the stuff that we would recognize uh, those of us that do qualitative uh, research. So it brings drama to it and it makes visible um, that contemporary life. 
without the need for the explanation of the academic author. So it backgrounds the academic authorial um, voice. And we suggest that ethnographic drama is neither a verbatim account of research data, but nor is it entirely fictional. Um, we might call it creative non Fiction. And in a kind of more workshop environment, we would take you through how we move from field notes into play script, but I'm not, I'm not going to do that now. Um, what it does, we would suggest, is it lays the observed social world before an audience for critical engagement. And we're going to um, look at one last example uh, to kind of end my talk here, um, volleyball and ethnographic uh, drama. Um, so this play uh, particularly, or this script, um, continues to focus on the researcher. It's very much about what it is um, like to do observation of a men's volleyball team. So the play itself is about um, uh, observation and it's um, a play which looks at the relationship between um, the, the players and the, the researchers. And you can see there, there's a list of uh, 10 players and three researchers and some other public sector uh, stakeholders. Um, Al, um, uh, there is the coach from Hong Kong. He was... Um, he, he is originally the, uh, the key uh, participant. Um, and in the scene that you are going to um, uh, listen to, um, um, Al has been invited into the university to watch some of the films that the researchers have been making. So actually, the, most of this play is really based in the, in the volleyball court. So it really focuses on the playing and the movement um, of, um, of the team. But the scene that you're going to listen to, um, uh, Al has come into the university and um, the researchers have said, please watch this and tell us what you think is happening. One. Act three, scene one. Five days later, lights up, a meeting room at South England University. Amy, Wendy and Ben sit around a table. There is a vacant chair at the table. Wendy takes out a laptop computer from her bag, places it on the table and switches it on. I was thinking that we might go through the video before Al arrives, you know, so that we are familiar with. Yes, 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 I have it. I have it here on the laptop. We can look at clips of last week's match. That's fine, yes. And shall we have a quick catch up as well to check where we are with everything? On the door. Hello? Come in. Enter Al. Hello? Oh, I'm sorry, am I early? I, I took a taxi to the campus. I can come back in 10 minutes if you... Um, no, but... not at all, not at all. Please, please come in, have a seat. Thank you for taking the time today taking time out from work. I, I know it can't be easy. Oh, that's fine. My deputy manager is looking after the salon this afternoon, so no problem at all. Oh, yes, you own a beauty a beauty salon. I'm just the manager, but yeah. <laughs> if you're ready, we thought we would play a couple of clips of what we have been observing and filming and ask you to comment if that's all right. Of course, yes, yes. Yeah. This is the beginning of last Friday's, last week's match. We'll play the first part of this, if I can cue it up okay. Wendy plays a video clip. They all watch the computer screen for seven seconds. Sound is amplified and clearly audible. A long and loud blast on the referee's whistle. Coordinating, rhythmic clapping of several pairs of hands. Synchronised with each clap, men's voices chant, Oi! 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 Wendy pauses the video. What you have there, I can see already, shall I say? Yes, yes, please. Please do. I mean, the ball's not even in the play. The match hasn't started as such. But what you've got is, well, some teams, they have special chanting, clapping, their, their supporters join in. They have a deliberate strategy to pump themselves up, make themselves heard by the opposition, sort of intimidate the other side. Whereas our team, I, I think they're a bit too quiet. Yes, yes, yes. But before we move on... I wonder whether we can go back to the last... Of course, yes. 
I'll rewind though. Yes, this, what this. Is, is there something there you want to? Well, I was wondering. I mean, with all the gestures of solidarity and unity and all that, I was wondering whether they can work the other way. How do you mean? Like, well, yes, in that example, Justin is Filipino. I mean, he is a player of colour. He approaches a white British player, goes to him for support, low five. But his initiative is rejected. Ryan turns away, walks away and... Uh, what? So you are saying... I have to say, I was thinking that. I was. I, I agree. I mean, if you look at it, it's hard to escape the fact that here is a person of colour offering his hand to a white person and being rejected, that is. I, I really don't. All that history of colonialism or coloniality, you, you can't get away from. In Spain. Uh, Portugal, was it? Or Spain? Spain. You can't really. I, I mean, you can hardly tar Ryan with the same brush as Magellan. Weren't the Americans here there at some point as well? Whatever the specifics of the history, I mean, you can't take, of course, I wouldn't take an a historical perspective, but here is a person of colour offering his hand to a white person. Yes, but you can't. The history. You only have to scratch the surface and... But the Philippines, I, I don't... This is not the Philippines, is it? It's here. It's now. It's last week. It's last Friday in this city. Uh, could we go back? I, I wonder if we could go back a few seconds on the video, rewind a few seconds. Tell me when to stop. Yeah, yeah, stop, stop, yes. C could you play from there, just just that little bit? Is, is that all right? Wendy plays the video clip before watch the computer screen for five seconds. Wendy pauses the video. Is there something there, Al, that you want to... I was Well, I was going to say that Nat is also from the Philippines. He is also, if you like, what you might say, a player of colour. But Ryan chooses to approach that. In fact, deliberately moves a good distance from court from front court to back court, stretches out his hand to him and... It's a good point. We have to be careful not to... Uh, to I, I wonder to... if there's something else going on here, something about... Well, I, I think that Ryan can... Well, I've known Ryan for a few years. He can, he can be quite tough on the new players compared to those that you might call the old hands. I. You think that might be where the fault line is? That's the line of difference here instead of... Rather than it being about racism. I just think you have to be alert to this. You can't, you know, you can't make excuses. Excuses? You can't airbrush out. Airbrush? There's the old hands versus the newbies, yes. But another dimension of it, another potential point of difference is between students who might only be with us for a season and what we call community players who have been members for some years. They're, they're not students. You see a tension between students and community players. Would you like to say more about that? I, I don't want to make a big deal of it. I wouldn't say tensions necessarily, but I think there are different levels of commitment, different... Shall we watch another? Shall we look at another clip? Lights dim. The scene is both fact and fiction, both reality and constructed reality. The scene is not a verbatim representation of a single audio recorded conversation between the key participant and three researchers. But the discourse of the character is both true to the world of the drama and testimony to the debates that were in circulation at the time of our observations. Techniques such as ethnographic drama are able to reveal multiple and often contradictory perspectives in representing how people act in certain ways and hold particular sets of values and beliefs. And I think what we also hope and I, I, I want to say is that they show the researcher seeks not to settle the question but to unsettle them. So I have drawn quite a lot from Judith Butler's uh, excellent book, Giving an Account of Oneself, um, in which 
uh, she argues really that um, to give an account of oneself uh, means finding ways not to speak for the other but to listen uh, to the other and I would like to end with quite a lengthy quote from hers because I find this uh, inspirational to be undone by another is a primary necessity an anguish to be sure but also a chance to be addressed claimed, bound to what is not me, but also to be moved, to be prompted, prompted to act, to address myself elsewhere, and so to vacate the self-sufficient I as a kind of possession. Perhaps most importantly, we must recognise that ethics requires us to risk ourselves precisely at moments of unknowingness, when what forms us diverges from what lies before us, when our willingness to become undone in relation to others constitutes our chance of becoming human. And um, I'm going to end by just thanking the many people whose voices you heard uh, throughout the talk. My family, uh, Joanna Kreese and Ada Awuna, Billy Kreese and Anna Jacobs, Tilang researchers, Agneska Lyons, Ju Hua, Yolana Hanusova, uh, Daria Yankowitz Patel, Adrian Blackledge, Francis Rock, Rachel Hu, Jane Gobber, Sally Franklin, Lindsay Gilby, Jill, Jill Fogging, um, and uh, to one person whose <laughs> who's singularity, of course, is very, very important to me, Adrian Blackledge. Um, and uh, if any of this is of interest uh, to you, um, we have a new book coming out, Essays in Linguistic Ethnography, which talks about both the ethnographic uh, drama and uh, poetry side of our work, as well as the vignettes and what it is to work in uh, research teams. So thank you very much. Thank you.